Rural Heritage on RFD TV is brought to you by Rural Heritage Magazine, a bi monthly magazine featuring articles about farming and logging with draft animal power, small scale diversified family farming and homesteading, and other aspects of our rich rural heritage. Rural Heritage Magazine, borrowing from yesterday to do the work of today. For subscription information, please call 319 362 3027 or order online at www.ruralheritage.com. All right, welcome. Today we're going to do a little beginner project. Uh, if you was to come to a blacksmith or go to a blacksmith shop looking to learn how to do a blacksmithing project, probably one of the first things that you're going to learn how to do uh, other than learn about the tools of the equipment would be to probably make a, an S hook. Uh, that's very simple, very, uh, very basic, and that's what we want to go through today. A few basic techniques, a few basic projects that, that's very beginner oriented. So what we'll do is we'll go into the fire with this one piece of the end of the iron. And we're just using a piece of 5 sixteenths or so uh, steel, mild steel that you can get about any hardware store or a steel supplier or sometimes out in a fence row. There's a lot of, a lot of scrap to be had around if a person keeps his eyes open. So as we're bringing this up to heat, I'm turning the forge blower handle, which is bringing air in up and underneath the forge into the fire. We're burning coal here today. And that makes the air flow come through into the fire and of course obviously makes the fire become hot. And that enables us to get the heat we need to heat up our piece of steel. And as you see it, it's already beginning to take color, beginning to take heat. And as a blacksmith, that's we do a lot of our work by color determines how much heat piece has in it. We want to get it up to a better temperature than that. It's going to be a lot brighter than orange and yellow when we come out of the fire. So we're at a real good forging temperature already. So we're going to come out of the fire. We're going to go over to the anvil and we're going to take the hammer to this. We're going to start drawing out the end. Now this piece is round as I start. But I'm, what I'm going to do to draw this out down to a point is I'm going to square it up and I'm going to use the hammer to just keep chasing this little lump of steel ahead out towards the end. As you can see, my color's leaving. The uh, air is drawing out the heat. The anvil is pulling the heat in. So we've only got a limited window of time where we're able to actually do our hammer. And when we get to that point, we have to go back in the fire and reheat. Now the thinner and smaller that gets out on the end, the less time obviously it's going to take the uh, heat to uh, heat it up to be ready to forge again. So the thinner and, and smaller that that becomes, the more pa uh, patience and, the, and, and more attention we have to pay to that or else we can turn that into a, a 4th of July sparkler inside there and then just burn it plumb off. It, it won't take a whole lot now. There's times when I'm doing real light work that I will just uh, hammer something so small and then just basically lay it in the fire and let not even turn the, the forge blower handle, not put any air to it whatsoever, but just to let it sit in there and it'll just soak the heat back into it. So just that quick, we're ready to come back out to the anvil. And we're going to work on the sides again, maintaining a square right down to the end. Have a nice little point on the end. So now we've got this all worked down to a fair point. Now this whole piece, as you remember, is round. And to maintain that round, we've got four corners now. And we're going to want to take those edges and those corners off to make the whole piece round before we would want to do a scroll or bend, unless you want to keep it square, but we're going to take those edges off. So we'll go back to the fire. Drag in a little bit more coal here. 
as we turn that handle, we're burning up coal. We have to kind of keep adding all the time. You might notice that over here I've got all my fresh, what I call green coal, which I haven't put to the fire yet. Just like it'd come out of a mine. Now back over this way, I have what's called coke. And that is basically coal that I've used in previous fires. I'll drag it up here and, and store it away to use later. Uh, it's already had all the impurities burn out of it, down to its carbon form, which is what we want to do to get our coal coked to make a usable blacksmithing uh, fuel. I'm kind of turning this just a little bit to get heat all the way around it. I'm keeping it up high on the fire instead of down in the fire where I can see it because I don't want to burn my end off. So now we're back to the anvil. Now we're going to work on those four corners and those four edges. So just hammering just lightly enough just to do what we need to do. As you notice, I'm not, I'm not hitting it real hard. I'm just hitting it just right. I'm working on just the edges only. Just a little squaring up once in a while. So there you see we've got our, uh, our point drew out from that main bar of stock. So we're ready to do something with that end now. And I thought what would be nice is we would uh, go ahead and do the turn of our S-hook first and then take a pair of scrolling pliers and then scroll or scroll on the end. Uh, you can do the scroll first on the edge of the anvil or on the end of the horn and then do your S-hook. But what I find if I do it that way, before uh, I can do the S-hook part, once I get it hot enough to do it, I have to go in and dip my end where I've got my scroll in the water and cool it off. Otherwise, if I hit it with my hammer, I flatten out my scroll. So I think it's, it's efficient to do it, do it like I'm fixing on it. Okay, so we're going to come out of the fire here. We've got a nice longer heat this time of our piece of steel. And we're going to come out to the cone. We're going to come up here above it a little ways. As you see, I'm going past. I'm going to take my hammer and I'm just going to pull this around as such to form this end of my S-hook. Now, as you notice, I've left this part out here. Remember, we talked about we was going to do a scroll. So we'll heat that back up and then with a pair of pliers, we'll put our scroll end on. Okay, we've got our scroll and pliers ready and we got our heat on our end. So we're going to come out here and just this easily. We're going to take our scrolling pliers and we're going to walk this down into a nice little scroll. Now, you can see it's a little off kilt, real easy to fix. All we got to do is lay it on the anvil, tap it with the hammer just a little, and true that right up while it's still good and hot. And that will work just So now we're back to where we need to be, nice and true. We can adjust the, uh, the width of our scroll any way we want to do it at any time, while, as long as we're heated up. But I like the looks of that. It's got a nice, even flow. And we'll, uh, we'll go to the other end. Now, we want to make sure we remember that this is the hot end. Uh, we can do tongs and use, or we can dip it in the water. I'm going to dip... I'm going to take the tongs we use instead. If you uh, dip the hot end of water, it can make it brittle because it reacts with the molecules in the steel and it makes those brittle and it could possibly, if it dropped or something, could break. We'll roll this out of the way for a moment. Now we're going to work on the other end. Always continuing to remember this end's hot because we do not want to grab that end with bare hands and, and even with a glove. If You better have a pretty fair leather glove on if you're going to grab a hold of it. Drag a little coal out here. That also helps to keep some of that heat in. As your coal burns, it starts to burn and create some voids in the fire, uh, which is just basically empty places where there's not coal that's burning. Uh, Pulling that over there will trap some more heat in as well as start to burn some more coal to produce even more heat. So 
We want to do that, and that done the trick on that end. So we'll come out here to the handle, and we're going to start working our other end. Out. As you notice, I'm I'm not really moving my hammer a whole lot. I'm I'm pulling my piece of steel in and out to my hammer. Pretty much keeping my hammer in the same place. Then closer I get out here to the end of where I'm working, I come out closer toward the anvil edge. That way, whenever I'm working that end down real fine, I'm not hitting on my anvil face. I'm My hammer's hitting the uh, piece of steel, but the other edge of my hammer is out here where it can't come in contact with anything. Got a little more heat there I can work with. All right, so we got a good start on that. Uh, we'll go back in the fire and get a little bit more. So we're back to hot again. We'll come out to the anvil. Work this on out down to that end as we did before. Just trying to maintain a nice, even taper all the way to the end while the whole time maintaining the squareness. That gives us the ability to draw. If, uh, if I get careless and get it lumpy and do all kinds of things, it doesn't want to draw the way we want it to, and then it's not going to look right when we turn it. It's not going to have good even flow. So we'll go back into the fire. We're down to a fair point like we like. Uh, it should mimic the other side close. It's going to be hard to tell a lot of difference in it, but <clears throat> we want it somewhere in the ballpark. So as we heat back up, just like we did on the other side, we're going to want to come back out to the anvil and work just on those edges. We're going to take the squareness off of those edges, round that off, give it a nice even flow and a taper. And I'm not down into the deepest, hottest part of my fire. I'm riding the top of that fire, keeping a real good, constant, close eye on it because we can burn that little end of it off. So we don't want to do that. So just that quick, we're ready to come back out of the fire. Back to the end. Working only on the corner. Only on that edge. We don't want to hit it too hard. We don't want that whole thing to roll or twist. We just want to flatten off the edge. Now it's going to do a little bit, especially when you get down towards that end where it has to, something's got to get. So we'll come back up here to the top. As you can see, I'm just kind of giving that a little bit of a twist it up some here, and that looks pretty decent. So, we've got our first end made, we're working on our next one. This hook goes this way, now to make an S we've got to do it in opposite reverse. Uh, if, unless you want to do one this way, we would want to put it on and come back this way. It's always thinking about your next step the next step ahead that you're going to want to perform and being prepared when you come out of the fire to uh, go directly to that step and not have to stop and think about what you're doing. So back into the fire. Uh, this cone belonged to a good friend of mine. His name was Rex Walden and he was the man who inspired me to learn about blacksmithing. And this cone, I think, was pretty much his favorite piece. Whenever he would talk about blacksmithing, he would really brag up that cone and I'm so thankful to have been able to have that, not only to remember him by, but as also as well, even more importantly, to be able to use it to teach others and, and to uh, get other folks interested in the trade, just like he did with me. So it's, it's a blessing, that piece right there, and, and he was such a blessing to me as well. I know I'm looking and look like I'm looking at the fire, and I am at some points, but I'm also looking just off and out to the edges of the fire, because. That fire gets bright to your eyes directly, so it's not great to just watch it all the time. Okay, so we're going to come out here to the cone and we're going to do our next bend. We're going to come past where we want to uh, form our hood. And as you see, we left room for our scroll.
So step two, if you will. So now we're ready to heat this up and we'll do that freehand again like we did last one. Back into the fire. And I'm putting that scroll end down into the fire so it'll take heat the fastest. And down into the fire, I don't want to crank it very hard or very fast as I bring the temperature up quickly and I can burn my end off. So as we go here, I'm already thinking, preparing what my next step is. Uh, I'm gonna come out and we're gonna, got my pliers in my hand already. Don't have to find those. And as we come out, we'll come and we'll start to walk this down. Just like that. That one's a little squarer than the other one, but we always seem to always have to tweak it just a little bit. And that looks pretty close. What was that one up just a little bit to match the other? And this is probably pretty good. Now I'm checking this to make sure I'm in line. I don't want my hook to go off side either way. And that's pretty close. I don't mind a little bit. It does give it a little bit of a more three-dimensional look if you got it just a little. So if we was going to hang a flower pot or a pot of beans over a fire off a tripod, all kinds of applications that we could use a project like this. A bird feeder off your porch. All kinds of little ways that we could use a good S hook. So we hope you learned something today and if you if you do try to do this I wish you the greatest success. For almost 40 years Rural Heritage Magazine has helped readers borrow from yesterday to do the work of today. The magazine is packed with stories and information about farming and logging with draft animal power as well as other aspects of our rich rural heritage. If you or someone you know wants to run a self-sufficient diversified family farm or just learn how to make a weekend hobby farm more productive, Rural Heritage Magazine is a smart choice. Articles cover a wide range of interesting and useful topics and are written by people living on the land doing the work they write about. A one-year subscription is $34.95 for six issues, 24% off the newsstand price. Sign up for two years and save even more. Order online at www.ruralheritage.com or by calling 319-362-3027. That's www.ruralheritage.com or 319-362-3027. Uh, years ago, whenever I was a kid uh, in school, I used to get kind of made fun of a little bit because the other kids in the choir and all, they used to give me some trouble that I sound like Willie Nelson. But, you know, Willie Nelson hadn't done too bad for himself, and I particularly like his singing. I'd like to do a song that I wrote that, it's just a little jingle, but uh, it's just kind of a little bit of a tribute to, to my hero, Willie. May your days be filled with blue skies and your nights and peaceful dreams. May you always ride with the wind at your back and your face a gentle breeze. May you shine like a star wherever you are in all you say and do. And may life treat you kind with much happy time. This is my wish for you. My Harvest Strike freeze dry has been the best possible way to preserve my garden. I love canning and freezing, but having them freeze dry gives me peace of mind that they will last for up to 25 years in any environment. It's just amazing. I have a hunting family, and even the meat harvested from the woods can be freeze dried, and it tastes much better than when canned. All of my produce, meat, and fruits retain every bit of their nutrition because it hasn't been heated or boiled in water that sucks away all the nutrients. I love living off the land, and this allows me to do so throughout the year. It also gives me security knowing I have a pantry full in case of an emergency. We teach our kids to be prepared, and what better way to prepare than with the Harvest Right freeze dryer? 
For more information about my Harvest Right freeze dryer, visit HarvestRight.com. I want to show you how to make an easy meal with steak and herb butter. That's all there is to this. It's so good that you'll be making this weekly for your family on those days that you are super busy and you need an easy meal. The first thing that I'm going to do is get a, some oil, some olive oil into my pan and get it where it's shimmering hot. It doesn't need to be smoking, but almost smoking. I'm gonna heavily season the steaks. And you can do this with just about any cut of steak. Try to get heavily marbled steak, okay? And then I'm gonna put a little bit of pepper. Okay, my oil is getting nice and hot, so it's almost ready for me to put this down on it. This is the time to add any other spices or herbs that you would like to go on your steaks. Okay, I'm gonna put each of them down in here. Season side down. Now I'm gonna go ahead and season the other side of the steaks. While the steaks are cooking, I'm gonna prepare the garlic butter. I'm gonna clean my hands for a minute. I've already got some chives from the garden and put them in a bowl. It's about a tablespoon of chives. I'm gonna add some of my homemade, but you can use any kind of red pepper flakes. I'm gonna use about a quarter of a teaspoon just to give it just a little bit of heat. We like a little bit more heat, so I may go up a little bit on that. Um, I'm gonna add a stick of butter. I have some garlic that I've grown. It's super easy to grow. Just put it down in the ground and it sprouts right up. Just a clove, it's amazing. I have about four little cloves of garlic, small cloves, so if you have bigger cloves, then you may want to cut back to like one or one and a half, depending on how big they are. Some Parmesan cheese, a little bit of onions, diced very, very small. And now I'm gonna just stir this up and I'm gonna have my herb butter to put right on top of the steak. Okay. It's time to flip the steaks. Look at that beautiful color. I have my oven set to 350 degrees. I'm gonna put these steaks right in the oven as soon as this side gets brown, and I'm gonna let them stay in there for about three to four minutes to get um, medium rare. And so they're going about four minutes each side, and I'm gonna continue working on my butter and then we'll be ready to eat as soon as they come out of the oven. All right, it's time to remove the steaks to the plate to rest. And I'm gonna let them rest 10 to 15 minutes. And while they're resting, I'm gonna put on the garlic Parmesan butter. I have some extra chives that I got from the garden, and I'm just gonna put them all over these steaks. And they're gonna be beautiful to look at and wonderful to eat. And tonight, I'm serving them with a great big salad along with some asparagus. But really, you could serve them with just new potatoes that are boiled and just put this butter on top of those and you've got dinner. I hope you enjoy it. Visit me at gamingarden.com and stacylynnharris.com This program is available for purchase. To order your copy, please call 319-362-3027 or visit www.ruralheritage.com. Rural Heritage is a bi-monthly magazine dedicated to draft animal farming and logging as well as other aspects of our rich rural heritage. It is published by Mishka Press, which also offers a complete line of back-to-the-land books, DVDs, and calendars. Call or write for a catalog or subscription information. Or visit our website at www.ruralheritage.com.